this video today. Uh, my name is Lucas Foster and I'm a well-known author of ELT materials and today I'll be talking about a series that I wrote called Integrate Reading and Writing as well as some of the emerging trends in the ELT field. Um, so I've broken the presentation today down into five parts. So first we'll just be looking at a series overview and after that we'll take a look at some of the emerging trends and uh, theoretical framework that we used uh, for creating integrate after that we'll take a look at a unit walkthrough and then we'll look at some of the components including the teacher's guide answer key some supplemental materials and uh, the review sections of the book and then finally after that we'll talk about uh, how to apply some of the theories and the framework used to make the book um, and lesson planning and just practical use of the book okay uh, so first just jumping right into it let's talk about the general concept of the series uh, integrate is a multi-level reading and writing series uh, aimed at the beginner and intermediate uh, learners of english and it features reading passages uh, presented in a variety of formats on interesting topics linked to uh, common academic standards including the korean ministry of education standards and california um, core state standards from the united states um, and learners gain familiarity with reading skills which are reinforced through writing tasks and this is also known as skill transference so they're not just learning skills they're learning them and then using them um, reading comprehension is progressively developed in tandem with reading fluency and uh, students gradually expand their vocabulary through exposure to high frequency and academic vocabulary related to the unit topics. All right, and um, engaging videos and augmented reality content enrich the learning experience and provide multimodal input and opportunities for uh, developing digital literacy and 21st century skills. Uh, and this also just makes the learning experience a lot more fun and interesting for uh, students these days. Okay, so let's take a look at the components of the series. Um, it's fairly comprehensive. There is a student book uh, together with a practice book and there's also a teacher's guide answer key which includes a grading rubric to help teachers know how to assess students um, with this series uh, there's also some teacher development pages which uh, give like some teacher training tips and 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 more um, also for the supplemental materials which are uh, available for free download on our home page um, there are midterm and final exams, writing worksheets, listening worksheets, which can be used um, together with the content in the student book. Um, also, there are two free apps that you can download. One is the, kind of the standard class booster uh, mobile app. And then also there's an app that we developed specifically for this series, um, which is the Integrate Viewer app. And that helps uh, students uh, to view and access the uh, video content and augmented reality content that comes together with this series. All right. So um, there are eight units in each book and the topics are distributed along the lines of school subjects. So um, there are two units that are based on social studies, um, two units based on science, two units based on math, and then two units based on a special subject. So it could be like um, physical education or art or uh, music or something like this. Um, the first unit um, in each uh, topic distribution, so unit one, unit three, unit five, unit seven, these are all um, nonfiction units. Um, and then the second unit in each unit cluster, unit two, unit four, unit six, unit eight, these are all realistic fiction units and all of the units together are all based on um, academic objectives which are clearly written into the scope and sequence uh, pages 
All right, and then um, there are also some review units. And let's take a look at the unit structure, which uh, this uh, book has each unit divided into two lessons. So first of all, there's an intro page, and then there's lesson A page, and then lesson B page, okay? Um, the unit intro is two pages long, and uh, the lesson A is five pages long, and lesson B is also five pages long, all right? Okay, and we will take a deeper look at the unit structure uh, in part three of the presentation. Um, but for now, what I want to do is take a look uh, in this part at the theoretical framework um, and some of the emerging trends that we used um, as part of the pedagogical uh, framework for the series. Okay, so uh, we'll be taking a look at uh, three of the most important ones that we used, the four strand theory, CLIL, and 21st century learning. All right, so uh, first uh, let's take a look. As you all know and are well aware of, uh, there are four language skills, listening, speaking, reading, and writing and the receptive skills are listening and reading and the productive skills are speaking and writing okay this is an important part of the unit structure as you'll see uh, for integrate and this also ties into one of the uh, th main theories that we use which is uh, dr nation's four strand theory and as its name suggests, this theory is made up of four parts and it works in tandem with Integrate's uh, Lesson A input and Lesson B output model. So let's just take a look at uh, the four different parts of the four strand theory. Okay, so the first part is language focused learning, which is learning through intentional focus on language constructs such as vocabulary grammar and and things like this so learning to read uh, by learning language and uh, number two is meaning focused input uh, using receptive skills to learn new content with the language learned in strand one so in strand one language focused learning so you're learning certain words specifically and then in part two here meaning focused input you're learning some content so this may be something from for example a concept from a science class or something like that so in the first part you learn those words and then in the second part you learn uh, a scientific concept and uh, so the attention here is on the ideas being conveyed through the language and this is more of reading to learn something okay and part three is meaning focused output so now we're moving from the receptive skills to the productive skills and here students uh, need to demonstrate competency of learned language and content through speaking and writing so they're just basically explaining what they learned and then the last part is fluency development um, using the content that they've learned and the language that they've learned to reinforce and improve their fluency command and utility of the language so this provides a very balanced input and output approach and you will really see this in the lesson a lesson b uh, structure of the, the unit Okay, um, the other two uh, kind of guiding principles in the framework are um, CLIL, which stands for Content and Language Integrated Learning, and 21st Century Learning. And there's a small graphic here, and you can see what 21st Century Learning is comprised of. Um, and we especially focus on the four C's, uh, information, media, and technology, and the core subjects. Um, and students also build uh, life and career or social skills um, through some of the project-based learning as well. So uh, let's just take a little bit uh, of a look at CLIL so we can further uh, and clearly understand what it is. Um, basically, uh, CLIL is the blending of content and language. So it's the planned integration of contextualized content, cognition, communication, and culture into teaching and learning practices. So there's a dual focus. It's not just on English language. It's also on uh, school subject content. So um, 
that includes like science class, math class, uh, things like this. And the language uh, that's selected for the students to learn comes from whatever content they're studying, whatever academic discipline they're looking at, okay? Um, and you can see this very clearly applied in the scope and sequence of the book. So as I mentioned, um, there each uh, unit cluster is uh, focused on an academic uh, school subject. Um, so here we're taking a look at a science unit um, units three and four and you can clearly see the, um, the content related uh, parts of the unit here including the topic the academic objective as well as the reading format um, and then you can also see the language related uh, items which includes uh, the grammar structure the vocabulary and the reading skills and writing skills that they'd be learning in the unit. And when you put these two things together, that's where you get CLIL. It's integrating content, so science, math, social studies, and then language. And these are the vocabulary words, the grammar, and things like this. All right. And uh, so that basically does it for the theoretical framework. Uh, I could talk about this in much greater detail, but uh, we just want to get a basic understanding so that way we can move on and take a look at the unit structure. Okay, so now that we have a fairly clear understanding of the most important theories and frameworks that are used in the series, let's take a look at a unit walkthrough. Okay, um, so uh, basically, uh, the, the whole unit altogether sort of works in this effective reading process where the unit intro kind of activates students' prior knowledge. It, there's also an opportunity for teachers to establish background knowledge um, for students. Um, and then moving into lesson A, uh, students use reading skills to engage content, uh, checking comprehension, and then moving into lesson B. This is more of the output part of the unit where uh, you can check vocabulary comprehension and uh, vocabulary in use and uh, move on to extensive reading and fluency development. So this is kind of the, the basic flow or structure of uh, the unit. Uh, in the series. Okay, so uh, let's now just take a look at um, a unit by doing a unit walkthrough. Um, so this is a nonfiction uh, social studies unit um, in one of the books. Um, and each unit starts off with a really cool looking, uh, big, impactful, captivating image that uh, activates the student's uh, background knowledge and gets them thinking about the topic of the unit. Um, and uh, there are other parts of this page uh, which kind of like state the academic objective and give the goals of lesson A and lesson B on the left hand side and then some uh, questions, some warm up questions to get the students further thinking about and discussing the topic. Okay, so um, as I said the, the intention of this page is to activate prior knowledge of um, the, the topic for the students and um, you as the teacher should try to anticipate what the students background knowledge of the topic is so for example if it's something that you're sure that they've learned about in school or maybe you've talked about before with them then you know that they have a fairly decent amount of background knowledge about this topic However, um, if it's something that you're not sure that all of your students will have a uh, firm background knowledge on, then you can provide a stimulus uh, to help increase and strengthen their backla background knowledge about this topic. So you can um, use uh, original materials for this. So you could show them a map, maybe, if it's a, a, a topic um, about social studies. Uh, you could find a video clip, um, maybe on YouTube or something, about this topic. Look for it before the class and then show it to them. And this is just to give them some exposure to the topic and establish that background knowledge for them. And you can look through this really nice, big, uh, two-page picture and review the warm-up questions together and have uh, an open discussion about it in class or you could have students 
uh, maybe write down their answers to these questions, talk about it with a partner, and then write it down, however you want uh, to uh, use these warm-up questions. It's just a great opportunity for the teacher to engage the students. Um, and then I do think it's good to kind of uh, share everyone's ideas before actually uh, getting started with the unit. Um, and uh, moving on, um, I just want to give a quick note on culture. Um, it's worth looking at the content before you start the lesson because it's not just an English lesson. There's also content that the students will be learning. Um, and language and culture uh, are basically uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, language and culture are uh, together in a really important way. So. Uh, language is more than just a code. It also involves social practices of making and understanding meaning. And the way that you teach the language in a CLIL book like Integrate um, is a reflection of your own understanding. So taking a look at the unit content before your lesson um, and trying your best to uh, understand will really help you to teach this series a lot. Um, as I mentioned, there's a really strong connection between language and culture. And uh, this book explores cultures from around the world. So it may be uh, worth taking a look uh, before starting the lesson. Um, and you also should just think about how the language is being used in different parts of the book. Is it being used as a code for communicating information? Um, or is it being used more as like a cultural practice? This is kind of balanced throughout the series. And I think you'll be able to tell uh, where each one of those parts is. Okay. Um, so just moving on back to focusing on the uh, unit structure here um, in lesson A. As I've mentioned uh, a few times, the emphasis is on the input and the output part is in lesson B. So the emphasis here is on learning the language and learning the content and using the receptive skills to do so. All right, so in the first page of lesson A, uh, we, here we have language-focused learning. So I talked about that already when I covered the four-strand theory. And each unit introduces vocabulary that's relevant to the context of the unit. Um, the vocabulary sources are based on the uh, CEFR, the YLE tests, um, as uh, the New General Service List and uh, Korean Ministry of Education standards, as well as some other uh, well-known uh, sources. Um, also, uh, you can note that students probably will acquire vocabulary when they're doing the readings. So here we specifically teach um, certain vocabulary through language-focused learning. But students will also probably find uh, words that they're not familiar with in the reading and ask you about it. And you should actually provide the opportunity and direct students to do this because vocabulary acquisition uh, is also a great way for students to pick up new vocabulary. And the selected vocabulary that you see here on the page is um, divided up into different tiers of difficulty, okay? And um, if you're not familiar with uh, vocabulary tiers, then let's just take a look at this and understand this. So tier one is like everyday words that are familiar to most students. And they're just g general words that uh, English speakers use all the time. So for example, wheel, bake, dance. These are general words. They're very easy words and probably learned at a very low level. Um, tier two words are uh, academic vocabulary that are found in many different school subjects. So for example, difficult, unique, method. These are words that you, uh, a learner is probably going to learn in school, um, but that are used in different uh, academic disciplines like science, social studies, math, etc. Uh, tier 3 academic vocabulary which is domain specific. So these words like carnivore, you would only hear that word in a science class. Um, isosceles, like an isosceles triangle. 
you would only hear that in a math class. Or the word ethnic, you would only really hear this word in a social studies class. So we have these three different vocabulary tiers. And uh, most of the vocabulary in every unit is tier one and tier two. But because the units are focused on different school subjects, there are sometimes some tier three vocabulary words as well. And um, so some people may just pick up the book and think, oh, this, this word is difficult. Um, but it's not actually difficult because the context is provided uh, for the students to understand what this word means and how it's used as well. Um, so this is what you'll encounter in any uh, CLIL uh, content. So as I mentioned, that's the integration of content and language. So you'll see all three of these vocabulary tiers in Integrate. And another thing you'll see is the uh, grammar. Um, each unit highlights a grammar structure that is used in the reading passage. So we just draw the student's attention and have them practice it before the reading. So here the emphasis is on demonstrating the use of the grammar structure rather than necessarily l teaching or learning a new grammar structure. Uh, we just want to s uh, draw some attention to the students and have them focus on how this grammar is going to be used in the reading. So it's uh, once again uh, language, uh, using the language instead of necessarily teaching. Um, so, but this is also considered language-focused learning. Um, and uh, for the vocabulary and grammar, these are really important because uh, reading comprehension depends on uh, the meaning the students give to the words and the structures. So the more words and structures students know, the more thoroughly they can understand and engage the content, uh, read it, and comprehend it. Um, students should practice new vocabulary and grammar structures many times to fully retain them. Um, this is another theory that was applied to specific parts of the book, SQ3R, which stands for Survey question, read, recite, and review. Um, I'll talk about specifically where those uh, different things happen in the unit, but this also helps students to retain uh, vocabulary in their long-term memory. Um, and then the lesson A and B structure of integrate in the practice book, supplemental materials, heavily emphasize vocabulary and grammar, uh, specifically for this reason. Um, so. The Lesson A reading format, uh, it presents readings in ways that students will encounter them in real life. So what you see here uh, on the screen is sort of like uh, like a, an online uh, article that they would see uh, on a website. Um, and the reason why we present um, the readings in these, in these various ways that students would see them in real life is because it's one thing to learn language in a classroom and then it's another thing to encounter it in the real world and use it. So we try to present the readings in an uh, as authentic way as we can um, for the students. Um, and it's also more familiar to the students and it seems more realistic and less artificial. So I think they're more willing to engage and be interested when it's presented in a way uh, that they're familiar with. Okay, so uh, the different types of passage formats that we have are, for example, emails, uh, text messages, recipes, blogs, websites, magazine articles. We do have some traditional like academic book looking uh, uh, passages as well, letters and others. And as I said, it just provides a real world context um, that the students uh, naturally access information and um, students are more ready um, and willing to engage in different uh, types of readings that are presented in this way. All right, and um, now we'd be moving into the meaning focused input part of the lesson when, when we think about the four strand theory and this is the reading passage. Um, the focus should then uh, switch from learning the language to the ideas that are being conveyed in the text. And as I mentioned in the scope and sequence and actually on the page, the academic objective is clearly stated. Um, 
but as I also just mentioned, um, students may acquire some um, vocabulary. So they may ask you what uh, a word means. So you should be ready to um, answer that and even um, a uh, tell students to circle a word that they don't understand and ask about it after the reading. Um, and uh, context is provided to support uh, the understanding of the language and the content. So that's where uh, the passage format and the pictures and um, even the uh, words that come along with the pictures really help to support uh, the students' understandings. And then there's teacher notes um, at the bottom of each page. Um, and this really helps to uh, guide the teacher's focus for the lesson. So after uh, doing the reading, um, we then move into uh, reading comprehension and reading skill development. And this is meaning focused output now with um, the reading skills. So first, uh, students do comprehension to un ensure their understanding of the reading. Um, and then moving on to the reading skill part of the page, students develop critical thinking and higher order thinking skills. And then finally, in the third part, uh, they apply those reading skills to summarize the content that they learned in the passage. Um, this page uh, then is reflected in the practice book which, as I said, also uses the SQ3R theory. So the survey question and reading part happens in the student book. And then in the practice book, they can recite and review um, the language that they've learned. And uh, they apply this in their homework and improve vocabulary retention through repetition and practice. So they are able to store those words in their long-term memory. So that's uh, basically it for uh, the lesson A part of the unit and now we'll be taking a look at the lesson B part of the unit. All right, so looking at lesson B, um, as I mentioned, the focus of lesson B is on output. Um, so the emphasis here is on using the language that they've learned um, and developing fluency and exploring the content a little bit more. So uh, the first page of lesson B opens up with a meaning focused output activity. Um, in lesson A, the objective for the vocabulary part is to learn and become familiar with new vocabulary. And if you don't know about the four strand theory, you might just look at this as another vocabulary uh, activity for the students. But, but since you do understand the four strand theory, now you understand that this uh, uh, activity in the book is meaning focused. And in lesson B, the objective here with this vocabulary activity is once again to activate the prior knowledge of the students and to use the vocabulary. So the focus here is on using the vocabulary, not learning it uh, through practical application in context. OK, so they have a, the context of a sentence and they've already learned the meaning of the words and now they need to choose the correct word and decide how to use it uh, correctly. OK, and um, also, because uh, lesson A is intended to be one class and lesson B is intended to be another class, maybe they're looking at this content uh, two days or three days later after uh, lesson A, right? So this is also just uh, reactivating the, the knowledge about the topic for the students. Okay, and um, then you move on to the next page and you start to develop uh, fluency for the reading uh, of the students. And you recall the background information about the passage. Um, so before the uh, reading format uh, was presented to the students, and then on this page, they're asked to recall that information. And here, uh, the students complete uh, listening activity with the reading. And they also uh, are exposed directly to two bonus vocabulary words. Um, and these words are actually also present in lesson A, in the reading in lesson A. But here uh, in lesson B, we directly draw attention to them and ask students to uh, decide which is the right word. And 
uh, students complete the uh, reading activity and then they are intended to read this passage one more time and record their uh, reading time which they can track in the back of the book and this is an excellent way for uh, teachers, students, and parents to uh, track the development and the reading speed uh, and the fluency development of the learner. Um, they're also asked to recall the format and answer a question about that. And all of these um, activities on this page demonstrate competency and command over the language. Um, so once they have completed uh, this page, then there is a, a meaning focused. So we're kind of jumping back uh, to the third strand. Um, there's a meaning focus output activity which uh, develops uh, writing skills for the students. Um, so once again, uh, they're presented with a graphic organizer and it develops critical thinking and higher order thinking skills. And then they make a writing plan which uh, puts together the reading skill that they learned in lesson A and the writing skill that they learned from lesson B and they apply this synthesized reading and writing skill to complete their homework assignment in the practice book. Um, so you'll see that the same writing plan that's in the student book is also present in the practice book. Um, so this uh, develops the skills that they've learned in the unit. It helps remind them of how to complete the homework assignment because uh, sometimes students are in class and they understand something, but then when they get home, they maybe uh, forget something or there's a missing piece of information. But this uh, writing plan really provides a nice bridge between the classroom and the home and the students are able to complete their homework assignment because they remember how they synthesized the reading and writing skills and it provides the correct gradual reduction in support to get the students to use the language on their own and this is called scaffolding. Um, then um, on the next page, this is that, that uh, practice book page is intended to be as homework. So after the students complete the writing plan in class, the next page uh, are the IT skills page. And uh, this is also fluency development and focusing on digital literacy. Um, and there are two types of IT uh, skills pages, one that includes augmented reality and one that uh, includes uh, videos which are linked through QR codes. And once again, you can use the free uh, Integrate Viewer app to access this content. So this is how uh, to use this page. So first of all, you look at the preview, which is a quote that is taken from the video or the augmented reality and students are asked to make an inference. So throughout each unit they've been uh, learning language, learning content and practicing and building on what they're learning and the question here, the preview, asks them to make an inference based on what they've learned in the unit. Um, and then they uh, review the questions in part C and also look at the pictures which are provided in part B um, so that they are prepared for a listening activity um, that comes along with the digital content presented on this page. Um, and then as they listen and watch, they write the answers and discuss uh, the answers after viewing the uh, video or the augmented reality. Um, and sometimes, uh, depending on the uh, language ability of the students, you may want to present the video two times and give the students um, a chance to uh, write the answer if they missed one or check their answer um, if they were able to write all three answers for part C. The first time they watch the video, you can ask them to double check whether they got it right or not and show the video a second time. Um, this is another part where 21st century skills are really applied in this book, especially the information, media, and technology skills, but also the core subject skills um, are applied on this page. Um, and this is really the way that uh, young people are accessing information, not just for school, but um, actually at any time during the day, uh, 
young learners are uh, uh, accessing information through the internet online and uh, this graph just shows the online media consumption of the average American teenager this graph is actually uh, a little bit old so I think um, this uh, is even more true today so basically what you see here on this chart is um, all the hours in the day except for maybe the time that they're sleeping and how they're accessing information and uh, as you can see by taking a look at the graph uh, school is the only place where students are disconnected from the internet so traditional modes of classroom instruction cannot continue to be effective for students when information and consumption of information outside the classroom has changed changed so dramatically um, and you can see this even at like lunchtime during the school day the students are jumping back online and then when they get back into the classroom the teacher probably tells them to put their phone away and not to look at the internet but in the future uh, students will be accessing uh, I believe it would be like a paperless society but at, at this time we are providing kind of a, a transition and a blending of the uh, print content and the digital content for students to access its information and this is a lot more effective and just some more data here to back up this point again this information is a little bit dated so it's probably even more true today but US uh, primary school students um, this just shows the time that they spend in front of digital devices. So um, in from 2011 to 2013, there was a huge increase in the number of students who had uh, tablets at home. So it went from 8% to 40%, and it's probably even bigger than that today. And of the children uh, who had tablets at home, 36% uh, of them used the tablets in 2011, and now... Uh, in 2013, 72%. And as I mentioned, probably now even more and probably even younger uh, uh, learners as well. And here it just shows that they're spending an incredible at least three hours a day uh, from three to even over 10. Uh, so as I said, this just shows that students access uh, information and content through a uh, digital mean these days. Um, so basically this just means that mobile devices are becoming the norm for content delivery um, and what that means is it's the preferred method of accessing information for young learners. Uh, it increases their autonomy and their automaticity with learning language and content and we need to teach critical thinking and IT skills with our language learning content as well. And this is exactly what Integrate does through the IT skills pages and the apps. And uh, the Integrate viewer app is used with the student book on the IT skills page. Um, the class booster app is used for homework and outside the class and features a, uh, a teacher uh, management system. And uh, it also has a learning management system and um, gives informative feedback to the teacher about um, the students. So it shows how many, uh, if there's some activity with the Class Booster app, it shows how many questions they got right, how many they got wrong, how long they spent on uh, doing those uh, activities and questions. And both of these apps have a mobile and a desktop version, which are available for free. Um, so it's really, really uh, effective. And um, at the end of each unit, there is a meaningful self-assessment. So uh, this is based on the actual performance throughout the unit. Um, it's linked with the grading rubric in the teacher's guide and answer key, which I'll be talking about uh, next. And uh, it provides informative feedback for the teacher and for the student about the student's strengths and weaknesses. Um, so basically, the students can go back through the unit and see how many questions they got right, how many they got wrong, and where are the areas of weakness. So maybe vocabulary is an area of weakness. Maybe their reading skills need improvement. This is very, very useful and helpful for the teacher and for the student because it provides not only um, informative feedback, but individualized 
feedback. So not all the students are the same in the language learning classroom. Some of them may be stronger at vocabulary skills, but weaker at writing skills, right? So the students and the teacher are able to align their understanding of the student's performance and they're able to focus on the areas that the students need to improve on. All right, so uh, now let's move on to part four, which uh, I'll be discussing some of the other uh, components of the series, the teacher's guide, answer key, uh, supplements, and uh, the review section of the book. Um, so the first part I want to talk about is the teacher's guide, answer key. Um, and in that, you will find a grading rubric, which is based on the actual performance throughout the unit. And I just explained to you how the self-assessment page in the student book works. And this grading rubric is based on the same uh, standards as the self-assessment page. So it's based on the real performance of the student. And this really helps to further align the student and teacher evaluation and understanding of the performance of the student. And I think this is really helpful, not only for uh, improving the student's language uh, and their skills, but also for teacher-student relations. Because sometimes if uh, the teacher and the student don't have the same understanding about the student's performance, uh, it can lead to conflicts or problems uh, in the relationship between the student and the teacher, and the student may feel discouraged or the teacher may feel frustrated. So when they have the same common understanding of the student's performance, uh, this is really helpful, uh, not only for the language learning part, but for the uh, overall relationship between uh, student and teacher. Um, other parts of the teacher's guide answer key, um, it's a very practical, hands-on guide. Um, one thing that I really like about it that you'll see is that there are level tips. So maybe you feel the series is a little bit uh, high and your students are a little bit on the lower level scale. There are some tips, some uh, uh, additional activities that you can complete with each page for lower level students. Or maybe you think this series is a little easier for your students so there are tips for uh, high level uh, students for other types of activities that they can do and of course it's uh, an answer key so it has a page view with all of the sample answers um, it explains the objective and each section of each page so when you're preparing for your lesson uh, you can get a clear idea of the purpose of uh, each activity on each page and um, it's also used in conjunction and expands on the teacher's notes at the bottom of the page in the student book um, so it's very highly aligned in that way as well um, there are also some teacher development pages which cover some of the concepts that I've already explained in the video here and some of the theories like the four strand theory or the five step SQ3R theory. Um, there are graphic organizers that talks about tiered vocabulary and there are um, other concepts as well that I have not uh, explained in, in this video which uh, you can uh, read and understand and it provides a conceptual framework and plenty of resources for uh, monitoring and fostering the student's progress but also uh, developing yourself and your own skills as a teacher and even if you uh, know some of these theories or some of these frameworks uh, you can use this teacher's guide to help you understand how they're applied to this series um, also, you can see uh, some of the supplements. Um, there are writing worksheets, listening worksheets that uh, can be used with the videos from each unit. So for uh, the videos that are in the student book that you access through the QR code, there are subtitles um, because this is a reading series, reading and writing series. So we do want to provide those subtitles. Um, but if you also want to focus on listening with your students, we have uh, the same videos that do not have subtitles, and you can use these listening worksheets uh, with those special videos that do not have the subtitles. Also, there's a midterm test, which is based on the content in um, 
units one through four, and then a final test, which is based on the content for units five through eight, which also contain a listening section. Um, so it's fairly um, comprehensive. Um, another part, jumping back into the student book, um, there are project-based learning review units in the back of the student book. And these really focus on the 21st century skills, um, especially the four C's. Um, of critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and creativity. Um, so there's one uh, review unit for each two unit cluster. So for example, unit three and four is about science and there will be one review uh, that students complete uh, for that section. And um, this creates a context and meaning for the students which helps lead to creativity. And that is one of the main uh, four C's of 21st century learning. And it, it's also a demonstration of how uh, engaged the students were and how well they learned the content. Um, if we take here uh, a side-by-side -side, uh, contrast of rote learning practices versus contextual learning practices, you'll see that rote learning does not lead to creativity because it the students are not giving a reason to uh, uh, be uh, engaged with this content. It doesn't have meaning. It feels fake. Uh, the students are not really um, emotionally engaged. And so once they leave the classroom, they're going to forget most of it. However, with context, it's more meaningful to the students. They feel that it's more real. Um, and then they're emotionally committed to learning and engaging the content and this leads to a deeper learning experience and when they have that then they're able to use what they've learned to create something new and uh, this is a very key part of integrate and um, making it meaningful and authentic is uh, present throughout the series with the things like the uh, reading formats being presented in a way that they see in real life um, and just so many other ways as well. Um, and we can really see uh, how much uh, students remember or how much they forget um, when we take a look at rote learning practices versus contextual learning practices. So what are rote learning practices? Well, these are things just like uh, the teacher uh, lecturing to the students or just making the students read or something like that. Um, contextual learning is something like a group discussion or a project like in the review section of Integrate um, or doing a presentation where you uh, teach others about what you've created. Um, and you can see here on this uh, learning pyramid how much language uh, the students retain after 24 hours through uh, these different language learning practices. So lecturing and reading are the least effective. Students only remember uh, 5 to 10 percent after 24 hours uh, the language that they've learned. Audiovisual demonstrations and group discussions are more effective. Um, students are able to learn, uh, remember 20 to 50 percent of what they've learned, and then practice by doing and teaching others. They're able to remember more than a majority of what they learned, and so that's what the project-based learning uh, review does in integrate. So it's a very, very effective way to uh, have the students uh, review and create something fun uh, that they're familiar with uh, with integrate. Okay, so now that you uh, have a pretty good understanding of the different components that you uh, can use with Integrate, now let's take a look at the last part of today's presentation. Um, I'll be showing you a uh, demo lesson of uh, a CLIL classroom, and I'll talk to you about planning. So um, let's take a look at a CLIL lesson and explore some useful models for how to plan a CLIL lesson with Integrate. Okay. So uh, one of the things uh, that we're going to be thinking about and taking a look at is the CLIL matrix. So um, on the uh, horizontal axis, you'll see that there are the linguistic demands in the matrix are divided between low, which means uh, the language that they're learning or the linguistic demands in the unit are relatively easy and uh, it moves into uh, high, which means that the language is relatively difficult. 
and then on the vertical axis you'll see the cognitive demands so uh, you can also think of this as like how difficult the content is so if you're looking at a science unit um, how much background knowledge do the students have already and how much do they need to learn when they uh, are looking into the unit. So you have to understand the balance between how difficult the school subject is and how difficult the English language is that's required to read about and learn about and write about uh, that particular school subject. And when you're planning a lesson, you can plan a series of tasks uh, which go through this CLIL matrix and should start, like with task A, you'll see, the uh, cognitive demands and the linguistic demands are both low and then task B which would, would be the next task uh, it moves into slightly more difficult uh, language but it's still low but then uh, it moves into high cognitive demands so that means that the the concept of the school subject would be uh, moving into more difficult territory but the language is still on the easier side and then task C slightly more difficult for the cognitive demands and also slightly more difficult for the linguistic demands and then finally at the end of the lesson uh, students should have had enough support to be able to move into a task that requires uh, high cognitive demand and knowledge about the school subject as well as high linguistic demand okay so what we're going to do now is take a look at a CLIL classroom this is an elementary school classroom from Italy and I want you to keep in mind this idea of the CLIL matrix and also think about uh, what language the students are learning what kind of activities they're doing how difficult the language is how difficult the activity is uh, how difficult the school subject is what is the school subject uh, what kind of vocabulary what kind of grammar are they learning just try to keep these things in mind as you watch the video all right, so let's take a look. Today is a special day because we are going to talk about Electricity. Have a look to this video, please. Where does electricity come from, RT? Electricity comes from a power plant. Did you know that electricity, electricity, electricity. electricity is a form of energy. Okay, now it's time to check the vocabulary. Do you know the game memory? Yes. So, Ricardo, have you got fun? No, I haven't. Have you got a microwave oven? Yes, I have. What do we use electricity for? Washing machine. Drill. Radio. Duster. Fridge. Stove. Communication, power and motion, uh, light and heating and cooling. How much does this consume? 1,400 watt. 150 watt. I think 25. How much electricity do we consume at home? This is. We have to calculate the daily consumption and the monthly consumption. And sometimes we waste a lot of uh, electricity. This is a good game. Don't switch off the light when you leave a room. <laughs> so, I have to change all of this with this. What do you think? 
Okay, so uh, as we see uh, in the video, uh, the uh, activities that the teacher used go through the clue matrix. So let's just review that lesson, okay? Uh, what was the topic of the lesson? It was electricity. And then let's just take a look at the different tasks that the uh, teacher used in this uh, uh, demonstration lesson. Um, so task A, she just introduced the subject and uh, the vocabulary. Uh, and she used uh, an authentic resource of a video and uh, taught the students the vocabulary. So very uh, low linguistic demand and low cognitive demand as well. And after that, uh, the second part of task A is the output part to ensure understanding. So they just did a little vocabulary activity, a memory game. Um, and then the teacher moved into task B, so getting a little bit more difficult in terms of the cognitive demands placed on the students. So they discussed different uses of electricity, and uh, after that, to uh, check their understanding of that, they did a vocabulary classifying activity. Uh, it was a group activity. It's reviewing the vocabulary and uh, thinking about the different uses and classifying them. Then moving into task C, it starts to get more difficult in terms of the uh, subject and also the language that they're using. So they're reading and understanding the uh, uses of electricity, uh, starts to introduce a math concept by um, understanding how much electricity each uh, um, uh, device uses and, um, and then comparing and understanding uh, uh, how much um, and again this is a group activity with math and then the teacher asked the students to look for information and uh, calculate electricity use and costs and uh, this really tested the knowledge of the students uh, at the end by uh, playing the saver and waster game because she uh, used all of the knowledge and language that the students had learned throughout the lesson and made sure that they understood by talking about whether uh, certain appliances uh, and certain situations save or waste electricity. So this is a very effective uh, um, clue lesson. And you can see that she used the Quill matrix and a series of input-output activities um, to teach the lesson very effectively. And there was also some grammar um, in the uh, lesson uh, where uh, students asked if they uh, have something and uh, they would respond whether they have it or not. So there's vocabulary, there's grammar, and then they're also learning the content. Uh, very effective, uh, great example of a clue lesson. Okay, um, and at the uh, and the highest level of understanding um, is creativity. And I've, I've shown you how uh, contextual learning can lead to creativity. But it's important to understand how do you teach that? How do you facilitate that for your students? So at, at a minimum, I would say that you can cr uh, facilitate creativity. Okay, And understanding this model of Bloom's taxonomy can, uh, can help you to understand how you facilitate it with each task in a uh, clue lesson. So you have task A, task B, task C, and you can lace uh, these different levels of understanding into each task that you do with the students. Okay, so how do you facilitate it? Well, I would suggest that you try to match the thinking skills that the students already have or are developing in their native language and try to move from lower order thinking skills to higher order. So it's lower order starts with remembering and moves into understanding, application, analysis, evaluation, and finally creating. Um, so uh, you, you use contextual learning to do this. And um, you can think about how the students in the video did this. I, I kind of explained it a little bit already. But you can also think about how to apply Bloom's taxonomy when you're planning lessons with Integrate Reading and Writing. You use this and the CLIL matrix together with your understanding of the theoretical framework and the unit structure of Integrate Reading and Writing. And I think you'll have a, a, 
a very wonderful experience using Integrate. And if you have any questions or suggestions or comments about this video, about Integrate, or about me, uh, you can leave a comment uh, in the comment section of the video. And I really appreciate you all taking the time to listen and understand. And I hope you have a great experience using Integrate and with Compass Public.